Thank you. So, so it's really a great pleasure. So it's my first time in, in Bulgaria. So, so I, I received a wonderful welcome. So I am very happy to, to, to be here to, to give this talk today. So um, maybe just a few words about myself. So usually in my, in my uh, uh, biography, I, I say that I hold the DeepMind uh, chair uh, in AI at the University of Oxford. And uh, well, uh, when I was recently at the iClear conference, I wanted really to, <laughs> to hold the chair. So well, I'm actually not affiliated with DeepMind. <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, so as Martin mentioned, I'm a professor at, uh, at Oxford. So I previously uh, also worked uh, in the industry. So I spent about eight years at Intel as a principal engineer. And uh, in the last four years, I was um, also at Twitter leading the uh, uh, craft learning research division and um, basically got into these uh, big tech companies as a result of doing some successful startups so, uh, that, that were acquired, so uh, that, that, that are listed here, that I will also mention uh, in, uh, in my talk today. So the field that I, I work in is called uh, deep learning. And uh, probably uh, you heard about deep learning, so it, it is kind of transformative revolutionary technology that is supposed or is already changing the way, for example, we do science, uh, the way that many businesses operate. Uh, I think recently it also got into this kind of uh, interesting twist of uh, being considered a kind of uh, doom or uh, evil power. So, well, make judgments yourself. So I'm actually, I, 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 I'm very skeptical about all these uh, prognostications. I think it's, it's a, a positive transformative uh, technology that we can use for the benefit of humankind. And I hope to give you some idea about how uh, this can be used uh, in this talk. So I would like to start with, uh, mathematical foundations of uh, deep learning and this is what we try to do in this field of geometric deep learning and uh, I would like to open with this quote from Hermann Weil who was one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century also with fundamental impact in mathematical physics and he uh, spoke thus poetically about uh, a, an important concept which is concept of symmetry as narrow or as wide as you may define its meaning that according to him was one idea by which men through the ages have tried to comprehend and create order, beauty, and perfection. So uh, the term itself actually uh, goes back to ancient Greece, and uh, ancient Greeks like Plato believed uh, symmetric objects to be so important that they should be somehow at the very foundation of the universe, right? So Plato believes, for example, that all stuff in the universe is built out of symmetric polyhedra that nowadays we call platonic solids. And if you think of it, it's not that crazy. That's how crystals are organized, so it's, it's still uh, holds water uh, thousands of years after in modern day crystallography. So ancient Greeks are also credited with uh, defining the, the foundations of or formal system of what we call uh, today geometry or still probably teach at school as the geometry, Euclidean geometry that was based on five uh, basic axioms or postulates uh, from which it was derived. And as you probably know, the fifth postulate was a kind of special thing that, that people tried to deal with for hundreds of years, first unsuccessfully until the 19th century when the Euclidean monopoly was uh, finally broken. So it was shown that you can construct other types of geometries that go outside of the Euclidean universe. And uh, as a result, uh, what happened is an entire zoo of different uh, geometries em emerged. And it was not clear at that point what actually defines in geometry, how uh, different geometries are related. So came uh, forward uh, Felix Klein, uh, a German mathematician, only 23 years old, when he got an appointment as full professor at the University of Erlangen in Germany, in Bavaria. And as it was customary there in Germany, I think still customary, uh, he was asked to deliver an uh, inaugural talk, uh, which entered the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program, where he proposed a radically new approach to uh, studying geometry as um, a class of transformations to which you can subject your geometric objects, and then you look at what kind of properties remain unchanged or invariant. And these are exactly these uh, invariants, right, or preserved properties or symmetries formed uh, the very foundation of geometry. So you could define, for example, Euclidean geometry as all the properties that would be preserved by rigid motions, right? And he advocated that projective geometry is the most general one, so he was able to incorporate uh, non-Euclidean geometries into this perspective. And it really had a big uh, impact not only on geometry, cultural impact on mathematics, so category theory, you can think of it as uh, an abstract development of these ideas, 
But it importantly had uh, the, probably the biggest impact on physics in the 20th century where uh, from these ideas came the realization that you can derive, uh, for example, conservation laws in physics from first mathematical principles of symmetry. So the famous uh, theorem of Amy Neuter that showed that, for example, conservation of energy, you can derive it from the symmetry of time. So something that before that was purely empirical now could be formulated mathematically. And uh, this idea was so powerful that it ended up in unification of forces, so the, the theory of Young and Mills. And uh, basically all the physics that we know nowadays, well, maybe with the exception of gravity, boils down to different types of symmetries. So what is called uh, external symmetries, so uh, the, the Poincaré group that gives rise to the Minkowski geometry of, uh, of special relativity, or different uh, symmetries uh, of quantum fields that define different types of interactions of particles. So that's what we call the standard model. This is more or less on the only physics that we know, right? So I think it's, uh, uh, nobody put it better than, than Philip Anderson, the Nobel laureate in physics, that, that he said famously that it's only slightly overstating to say that physics is the study of symmetry. Now you may ask, here you came to hear a talk about machine learning, right, or artificial intelligence, what does it all have to do with machine learning? So in machine learning, if you look at the landscape of different, for example, neural network architectures that we use in deep learning and its applications, we also have a zoo of different uh, things, right, or different, uh, different models that, that um, resemble a little bit the situation in geometry in the 19th century in the sense that these models uh, were developed uh, separately for different types of applications like convolutional neural networks were developed uh, in uh, image processing and computer vision uh, for the analysis of uh, images. Uh, recurrent neural networks were developed for time series and sequences and craft neural networks, for example, originated in chemistry for the analysis of, of chemical crafts. So apparently there is no uh, common denominator that, that unifies these, these models and as a result people basically approach them as a kind of uh, set of tricks and, and uh, maybe obscure empirical choices. So in uh, geometric deep learning in the spirit of uh, the Erlangen program, uh, I don't want of course arrogantly to compare ourselves to, to Felix Klein, but we use similar approach or similar ideas, we want to find a common uh, mathematical, uh, mathematical common denominator for different, uh, for different architectures that exist in deep learning and derive them from first mathematical principles, one of which is the principle of symmetry. And if you think of machine learning problems, right, at least in the simple setting of, uh, of supervised learning, uh, so some cynicists would say that this is just glorified curve fitting. So if you think that, that these things will at some point become alive and will kill us, I think that uh, that's probably a very remote opportunity if at all it will happen, in my opinion. Uh, so let's say that you want to solve a problem of image classification. So you have cats and dogs that uh, you want to, to tell apart, right? So you have some black box that approximates a function that uh, is a cat and dog uh, classifier, right? So in the, typically what you put in this black box is uh, some kind of a neural network, like the one that is shown here, one of the first or, or the er earliest instances of artificial neural networks developed in the 50s by Frank Rosenblatt. Uh, so these architectures, even though they are very simple, if you just connect uh, two layers of such units, what is called the multi-layer perceptron, they actually turn out to have what is called the universal approximation property. So you can take any continuous function and you can represent it uh, to any desired accuracy with this kind of architecture. And uh, this means that it's very powerful in principle, right? Of course, it's not uh, a kind of result that is constructive, so it tells you that in principle you can do it, but once you start studying it, uh, for example, you can ask how many uh, uh, samples you need to take uh, of your function in order to be able to approximate it, then of course you need to introduce some uh, extra assumptions because there are infinitely many functions that can interpolate these, uh, these data points. So typically you, uh, uh, you impose some additional uh, priors, what is called regularity in mathematics. And mathematicians have very well-defined notions like Lipschitz continuity, right? So these are well-behaved functions that, uh, that people like to analyze. The problem with these with these uh, kind of uh, assumptions is that they don't scale with dimension. So if I take, uh, for example, my data set of cats, right, and these are images even of very small size, they are, uh, you can think of them as points in thousand dimensional spaces. And uh, if you want to, to now to think of them as, as vectors in this uh, high dimensional space, and you ask the question how many samples you need to approximate a Lipschitz continuous function, right, this nice class of functions that mathematicians like so much in functional analysis, it actually scales exponentially with dimension. So uh, for even very modestly sized images, the number of cats and dogs 
that you will need to, to, to sample, to see, to train your neural network will probably be more than the number of atoms in the universe, right? So there are not, not enough animals around to, to, to do this training, right? So th these kind of approaches that work well in low dimensions do not work well in high dimensions. And that's why that's not the right uh, approach for, um, uh, for solving these kind of problems. And machine learning, unfortunately, has to deal usually with very high dimensional data. It could be hundreds of thousands or even millions of dimensions. So the idea of geometric deep learning is that it's not just high dimensional vectors, not the way that we want to think of our images or other types of data. They actually have some underlying geometric structures and we can think of them as uh, some objects that live on the low dimensional uh, space, geometric space. And like images, you can think of them as uh, basically some functions that are defined or signals that are defined on a grid, right, or on a plane. And with, uh, in the plane, you also have some structure. So you can associate, for example, uh, a group like Klein did in his construction of geometry. For example, the group of translations that move points on the grid from one point to another. And this group also acts through what is called the group representation. It acts on images that are defined on the grid. And then you have functions, right, like our cat and dog classifier that, that takes as inputs these, uh, these images. And you want to design this function in such a way that it respects this symmetry in a certain sense, right? And uh, you can clearly see why this is important because if you want to solve uh, image classification problems, like for example, I want to classify this digit three, and this is a very practical problem, for example, in optical character recognition, if I just treat it as a vector, even if I just move this uh, digit by one pixel, the vectorized uh, input into the neural network will be very different. So I will need to do what is in deep learning terminology is called data augmentation. So I will need to show the neural network a lot of examples of the shifted uh, versions of the digit three in order to, to hopefully to train it, to recognize it, all the instances as the same class. So this obviously didn't work even in the early attempts to use uh, these kind of architectures for, uh, for digit classification. So the inspiration for a new kind of architectures came from neuroscience. Famously, first, the neocognitron of uh, Fukushima, where he used uh, local uh, shared weights in the neural network, and then the classical convolutional neural networks of Jan de Kahn that are basically bread and butter nowadays of uh, uh, computer vision and uh, uh, image analysis uh, applications. And if you think of it, basically, what, is, uh, the, the, what are the underlying mathematical principles of these architectures, it's exactly what I showed you before. So you have your data that lives on a domain with which we associate some, uh, some group, in this case, group of translations. Uh, then it acts on images uh, through the shift operator, right? So that's the representation of the translation group. And then we have convolutions that are linear equivariant operations. So they, uh, they commute with the shift. So they, uh, basically, they respect this symmetry. And then you stack multiple such layers into an architecture and you get uh, basically an architecture that is designed to be invariant with respect to this operation. Now you may ask, okay, so images are simple, they are grids, what about uh, an object like this? So this is a graph that represents a molecule. Actually, we are all familiar with this molecule, probably this is a molecule of caffeine. And uh, a very practical problem in drug discovery and drug design, you want to predict its properties. So you want, for example, when you're designing a new drug, you want to test whether it will be toxic or whether it will bind to some, to some uh, therapeutic target, right? So uh, in order to do it now, you also need to represent this, uh, this molecule in some way, right? So, and you don't have a canonical order of pixels like you had in images. Here, any permutation of the pixels uh, would be legitimate, right? So we are talking about another type of symmetry, so that will be permutation symmetry. And graphs are actually uh, very common uh, objects that you, you want to do machine learning on. So you encounter graphs, for example, in social networks or uh, in computer graphics or in brain imaging. So they're really very common and very ubiquitous models for different uh, stuff uh, that, that, that you can model. So the geometric deep learning blueprint, uh, you can really find uh, uh, it is the same mathematical uh, foundation of practically any deep learning architecture that exists out there whether it's convolutional neural networks, whether it's uh, uh, generalization to group equivariant CNNs, uh, 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 recurrent neural networks, uh, deep sets, transformers, graph neural networks, and uh, mesh CNNs. So today I would like to talk about mainly on graphs and uh, geometric intrinsic CNNs and some of their applications. And uh, starting with graphs, I think I don't need to convince you that graphs are interesting. Uh, so graphs are really uh, an abstract mathematical model for uh, systems of relations and interactions from the very small scale like molecules to the very large scale such as social networks that I already mentioned. 
And uh, one thing that you need to know about the graph, right, and we can assume for simplicity that I have a graph that is undirected, uh, that has uh, some vector features that are attached to every node of dimension d. So one thing that you know about a, a, a graph that it's a topological object that doesn't have any particular canonical ordering of the nodes. So, but if I want to represent it on a computer, I must assume some ordering of the nodes because then I can represent the, for example, the features as a matrix, size n by d, n is the number of nodes in the graph, and the structure of the graph itself by what is called the adjacency matrix of size n by n, right? And again, there is nothing special about the order that I specified here, so I can provide a different order, right? And uh, for any different order, I will get a different representation. So it will be given up to the permutation of columns and rows. So basically, this is something that is built into, into the problem. So anything that I want to compute on a graph in this representation needs to account for this ambiguity, for the possibility of many possibilities of, uh, of representing this matrix, right? So I want some kind of permutation uh, symmetry to be, to be accounted for. So the two types of problems that we usually consider in the context of learning on graphs are graph level problems and node level problems. So graph level problems, imagine again the example of a molecule, so I want to predict properties of the entire graph, right? Uh, node level problems are, for example, what we are dealing with in social networks like Twitter. So I have a social network where every node represents a user and I want to find spammers, right? So I, I want to do classification at the level of uh, individual nodes in the graph. So in the first case, if we want to represent functions, right, so we want to learn some functions that take as input a graph and produce a number, no matter how I order the, uh, the input nodes, I want the output of the function to be the same, right? So no matter how I order the atoms in the molecule, it's still the same molecule, right? So uh, these functions will be permutation invariant, right, that are insensitive to the order of the, uh, of the nodes. In the second example of the application, when I want to classify different nodes uh, of uh, a social network, I want, uh, so the output of the function has the same structure as the input, right? So the output is given per node. So in this case, I want the, uh, if I change the input, the output to be changed in exactly the same way, right? So in this case, we call these functions permutation equivariant. So they change in the same way as the, the input is changed. And graph neural networks are essentially, they consist of layers of these permutation equivariant uh, 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 functions that produce uh, node embeddings or node representations that, that then can be pulled into a single vector or a single number to produce a, a graph level uh, a graph level representation in problems that, that require a graph level output. And usually this is done by what is called neighborhood aggregation or message passing. So I can take a node in the graph and consider all its neighbors, right? So basically all the nodes that are connected by an edge in this graph. So think of your friends on the social network. And these nodes will have some features, right, that I denote here like this. So basically I can collect these feature vectors from the, from the neighbor nodes together with the feature vector of the node itself. And this function will be uh, it's easy to verify with the permutation equivariant. And you can see graph neural networks are also a special instance of the geometric deep learning blueprint. Now the domain is a graph instead of being a grid, right? And uh, the, uh, the group that is associated with it is the group of permutations, so rep representing the fact that I don't have a, a fixed order of the nodes. Then we have node features, right, so signals that live on the node of the graph. And then we have functions that, like those that are implemented by message passing that are uh, equivalent with respect to these permutations. So they respect the symmetry in this way, right? And there are many applications of graph neural networks recently in sciences and engineering. So Google, for example, had a paper a couple of years ago where uh, they optimized uh, the uh, travel time or uh, uh, estimation in Google Maps using graph neural networks. Uh, and they, they got quite significant gains by tens of percents. In particle physics, uh, like CERN, where the particle collider where you uh, bang two beams of energetic particles uh, together and you produce some thousands of different particles, what is called particle jets. So these are also very uh, convenient to be modeled as graphs. And now uh, I think in CERN they're implementing in hardware some forms of graph neural networks that actually classify these events very efficiently in real time. Because they're collecting petabytes of data, they want to filter out something that is not interesting. And uh, more recently DeepMind had a paper where they used graph neural networks to guide the intuition in pure mathematics to prove uh, new theorems. So that was, uh, that was also, um, appeared on the cover of uh, Nature last year. So myself, I, uh, and, uh, the way that I got to Twitter actually was 
through uh, startup companies, so uh, around 2018, 2019, where everybody was talking about fake news, right? That was before the presidential elections in the United States. So there was empirical evidence in social sciences and computational so social sciences that uh, misinformation, all right, or what is called fake news, spreads uh, differently on social networks, in particular on Twitter. And by uh, collecting information on how different, uh, different stories spread on, on social network and having some uh, ground truth labels, we're, we're able to classify them f just from the way that they spread without actually analyzing the content itself. And uh, we had nice results, so we created a company. We thought it would be interesting. And uh, we were acquired by Twitter. So together with my uh, PhD students, we ended up, uh, ended up spending there quite fruitful four years. Uh, so here you can see that was uh, a few days after the, the, the acquisition was closed. So uh, actually two of them uh, haven't yet finished the PhD students, so they're now very wealthy. Uh, but uh, I still want them to finish their PhD, so sometimes this <laughs> doesn't go together. Maybe they will get an honorary degree, but <laughs> I, I, that was the deal at least initially. And. Um, so basically now Twitter uses this, uh, this technology for uh, different systems, uh, uh, for recommender systems, for uh, different kind of things that, that happen under the hood uh, that actually are not exposed to, to the users. So another type of geometric objects that uh, I would like uh, to mention are uh, manifolds and uh, geometric graphs. And uh, you may wonder why these exotic things, right? So this is what is typically studied in the field of uh, differential geometry, right? So the branch of mathematics uh, that, that was also born in the 19th century uh, and uh, uh, gave rise to these non-Euclidean geometries. So uh, out of the different uh, type of objects and domains that we can study in uh, geometric deep learning, so manifolds are actually one instance and uh, one example. And why do you need manifolds, right? So why to study these exotic objects in, uh, in the context of machine learning? So uh, first of all, they're very uh, natural and very native representation for three-dimensional objects. So if you think of uh, a three-dimensional object like the Stanford bunny that is shown here, you can of course think of it as a subspace of the Euclidean space, right? So it lives in 3D, so it's, you can represent it as, as a collection of voxels, right? So three-dimensional pixels. But if you don't care about what happens inside, it is a very wasteful representation, right? If I'm interested only in the, in the external surface of this object, then uh, I I would rather represent it as a mesh, which is a graph with some extra structure, right? And then you can use uh, tools from discrete differential geometry to model, for example, how it deforms. You can talk about uh, uh, isometric deformations, right, that do not stretch or tear the surface. We'll talk about it in a second. So another application, and again, I will talk about it towards the end of the talk, is uh, protein modeling. So proteins, as you probably know, these are biomolecules that, that occur uh, everywhere in life, in particular in our body. And we are interested in uh, understanding how they fold, how they interact with each other, right? Because that's also how we design drugs. So proteins fold into very complicated structures that you can see here. So it's a plastic model, but you see these colorful things, right? These spirals, uh, what is called helixes, right? And, and uh, other ribbon type structures. Uh, this is the protein fold. But if you look at it from the perspective of a molecule that interacts now with this protein, what it sees is a molecular surface. So it's charged, position in space uh, that it cannot penetrate beyond, right? So uh, a, a molecule that, uh, that looks to interact with this protein doesn't see the internal fold. It sees just the external surface that is shown here in this transparent plastic. So basically, uh, the surface-based representation, at least in some problems in protein, uh, uh, in, pro in, in protein study and protein design, allows to abstract out some levels of complexity that are completely irrelevant, right? So it makes a hard problem into an easier problem, okay? Now, what we want to do is to do something similar to convolutional neural networks that are used in computer vision, right? What we've seen in the beginning, basically where you have some local weight sharing uh, uh, to apply it to, to, uh, to three-dimensional surfaces, right? To manifolds. So how do we do uh, convolutions on images? So we can think of it as a kind of sliding window, right? So I have a filter and I slide it over the image and then I see how it correlates with uh, every position in the image, right? So something like this. Now. It doesn't matter how I move the filter from one point to another. If I move it along the blue path or I move it along the green path, I will arrive at the same result, right? Because geometrically, this is a flat space. But if I have a non-Euclidean object, if I have a manifold or a surface, if I move my filter this way, 
or I move this filter this way, I will get to a different result, right? And this, is, this has to do with some peculiar uh, object in uh, differential geometry that is called parallel transport. So things rotate when they move on uh, these kind of curved objects, right? So basically, I don't have a canonical way of uh, moving a sliding window around on a curved surface. It simply doesn't work, so it mathematically makes no sense. So what we'll try to do is we try to define some kind of convolutional cooperation in a different way, and we can uh, basically, without going too much into how differential geometry works, uh, you can think of manifolds as locally Euclidean spaces, right? So they're locally flat, same way as when we stand here, right, uh, and I look around myself, I would believe that Earth is flat, at least locally, right? But if I zoom out, of course, I see that it's curved. So same thing on a manifold, I can locally around a point, I can find a neighborhood where it can be identified with a plane, right, or a Euclidean space more of higher dimension more generally. And then if I want to measure distances and angles in this space, I can define an inner product that is called the Riemannian metric, right? So. Bernard Riemann was the one who first described uh, uh, these kind of objects, Riemannian manifolds that are named after him. So that's basically a way of working locally on, uh, uh, on surfaces and, and on manifolds. And then we can ask if I try to bend now this surface, uh, if I don't change the metric, then internally, if I look from the, uh, from, from the internally living on, on, this, on this surface, nothing changes, right? So, all the properties that can be expressed in terms of the metric are called intrinsic, so intrinsically uh, isometric deformations that do not affect the metric do not change anything on the manifold. So then I can define convolutional like operations by simply saying that I will work in the local space, right? So I will use a, an object that is called an exponential map, so I will go to the manifold, I will fetch the values of the function from the manifold, bring them to the, to the tangent space, and then locally I will apply some filter and then that, that could be uh, parameterized and learned and this is how my uh, convolutional neural network will work, right? And because everything here, uh, what is written is intrinsic, so, uh, is everything good? <laughs> Sorry, I thought that there was some, some problem. Um, basically, because everything is intrinsic, uh, uh, we, can define, uh, we can define filters that will be deformation invariant, right? So if I subject my object to, to deformations, nothing will change. Now, of course, what is written here is uh, cheating. So it's mathematical abstraction. And the, and the reason is that uh, I write here geometric abstract vectors, right? So I don't know when, uh, how you studied vectors at school, for example, but typically at school they tell you that a vector is, uh, you can think of it as kind of little arrows, right, that point in some direction. Or you can think of them as a race of coordinates, right? So n actually, none of these views is true. Vectors are just things that you can add in scale, right? If you want to think of them as arrows, you need to define an inner product. So we're talking about a more general object that is called a Hilbert space. If you want to think of them as coordinates, you need to define a basis with respect to which you represent them. So what is written here is abstract notions that I cannot really manipulate on a computer. So I need to provide uh, a basis. And this basis, unfortunately, is not something that I can define in a unique way, right? So basically, there are many ways I can define a basis. So on a Riemannian manifold that is orientable, if I rule out pathological things like the Möbius surface, this is defined up to rotation, right? So I can locally transform, I can rotate my basis in any way I want, right? And at every point, it will be different, right? There is no canonical choice. So basically, we have here, so we have a, an external symmetry, global symmetry, right, which are isometries, which form a, a group of isometries, but we also have a local symmetry, what is called the structure group, of, uh, uh, that is associated with this, with this manifold, right, or more correctly, of, uh, with this connection, uh, that uh, determines uh, the ambiguity in the choice of the local reference frame. And you can actually design these uh, filters in a way that would, they would respect the symmetry in the sense that it would be equivariant with respect to the choice of the gauge. So these are the gauge equivariant convolutional neural network. That was a beautiful line of work by Taco Coin from the group of uh, Max Welling in Amsterdam. Uh, and um, this is basically a generalization of the geometric deep learning blueprint locally uh, to, uh, to manifolds and, uh, and similar structures. And what basically these methods allow you to do, they allow you to def define filters as if you drew them on the, uh, on the surface, right? And now if I start bending the surface, the filter will bend together with it, right? So basically, they, by, by design, the architecture inherits a lot of uh, invariances 
uh, that might be very useful in some applications, especially when we want to analyze uh, deformable objects. And one such application uh, is uh, 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 markerless motion capture. So what you see here is uh, a kind of uh, strange creature that is uh, moving, but it is actually animated by an actor. So the actor is uh, making facial expressions, and then there is a scanner, a three-dimensional sensor uh, that scans uh, the, the actor in real time, and then these expressions are transferred uh, to the face of the, uh, uh, of the synthetic creature. This is actually uh, uh, a Swiss company called FaceShift that was acquired by Apple, and you can find on uh, the Animoji things that, you know, these kind of faces that you can animate with your facial expressions, so that, that is powered by, by the technology. And the, the little camera that, that you have in front of your uh, Apple phone is actually a three-dimensional sensor. Uh, so at, at that time, so that was uh, probably about uh, 10 years ago, uh, this is how it would work, right? So you would have some uh, three-dimensional sensor, that would scan your face and uh, will uh, transfer this information into some canonical model of the face that then would be uh, animated. So basically you want to synthesize uh, something that reproduces the expression from the, uh, from the input from the sensor. And basically there were no commodity sensors around that time. So uh, I, was, uh, 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 I created with my collaborators a company. It actually started from a different project of three-dimensional face recognition but it ended up that the sensor was more interesting. So here you can see uh, an FPGA prototype of the sensor working for the first time. So we used it for gesture detection. So that was around 2010. So around that time now, it looks like a trivial thing, but around that time there were actually very few sensors that, that, uh, that had this capability. So there was already Microsoft Kinect, but they didn't have enough resolution. And uh, this company was acquired by Intel in 2012. That's how I uh, ended up uh, working for Intel. And this become actually a commercially successful uh, technology that was called RealSense. So uh, Intel uh, advertised it uh, around the world quite uh, significantly. So this was, uh, I think this, this is an actor from the, the Big Bang Theory. I forgot his name. Uh, but basically he, here he showcases some of the applications that nowadays again uh, considered uh, quite common, but at that time it was, uh, it was something that was uh, almost groundbreaking. So the marking less motion capture was one of them. And you would require a 3D sensor to, in order to, to, uh, uh, to, to have these capabilities on your device. So Intel actually manufactured uh, laptops and tablets that had uh, built-in uh, real sense sensor, basically this little 3D scanner uh, that allowed you to, to have these, these kind of capabilities. And again, nowadays you find it uh, even smaller miniature, miniaturized version in, uh, in your iPhone. So it was uh, a different technology, but, but similar principles. So fast forward in around 2021 or 22. So you don't need any more 3D sensor to do these capabilities. So here you can see 3D avatars that are built from uh, two-dimensional conventional video input, uh, actually 10 times faster than real time on standard iPhone. So that was uh, a British company called Ariel AI that, uh, well, I cannot take credit for it. I only convinced one of the founders to leave Facebook for, in order to do this startup and also invested in it uh, uh, initially. And I had a PhD student that, that worked um, in this company, so, so the, he used uh, geometric deep learning techniques for hand tracking. So the, 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 the video that I showed before was actually uh, from his project that we presented at CUPR, one of the, the main uh, computer vision conferences uh, two years ago. And the company was acquired by Snap, so now if you're a user of Snap, then you can probably find some of this technology in, uh, in their products. And uh, this is uh, from Dominic's uh, uh, PhD work. So that, that's uh, reconstruction of uh, accurate hands from um, uh, two-dimensional images. So hands are much more complicated than faces because they have many more degrees of freedom. They're uh, deformable, there are many occlusions, right? So it's really difficult to get three-dimensional structure and shape of the hand right and pose uh, correctly just from two-dimensional image. So 10 years ago, I would say that you must have a 3D sensor for it. Now with uh, deep learning, with these particular algorithms, you don't. So I think it's quite impressive how the field has progressed. So that's why I'm very cautious about making any predictions because uh, something that I, I, would, I, I would have said uh, 10 years ago, I would definitely contradict nowadays. So I think it's, uh, that, that, that's, that's about the speed how, uh, how it moves. So uh, let me talk about, uh, in the remaining time, about applications in uh, molecular design and, uh, uh, and drug discovery. 
So I think these are probably the most interesting applications that probably were, we'll see the impact of uh, deep learning and geometric deep learning in particular. We are already seeing this effect, but probably to get to the clinic, it will take probably between uh, probably five to 10 years. And uh, I think uh, it might be really revolutionary. So uh, how drugs work, right? So uh, I, probably some of you know it better, but uh, myself as a computer scientist, I have no clue about biology and chemistry. So this is how I was explained, right? So first of all, it starts with proteins. So proteins are uh, something that is encoded in our DNA. So we have sequences of uh, what is called nucleotides, right? So these two billion of four letters that, that we see usually when we talk about DNA. So uh, these encode proteins. So we have a, a triplet of, uh, of nucleotides in the DNA that is called a codon. This corresponds to amino acid, one of the 20 proteinogenic amino acids, that in the cell there is some machinery, uh, biochemical machinery that uh, reads out these, uh, uh, these nucleotides from the DNA and transforms them into amino acids that form a protein. And proteins are everywhere. So we don't actually know any life form that is not uh, based on, on proteins, so they're really molecules of life. From defense against pathogens, right? Antibodies are large proteins. Uh, they deliver oxygen to our cells, right? Hemoglobin is a special type of protein. Uh, the cells work, they transfer stuff uh, through the membrane, so different types of pumps that exist in cells. There are also complexes of proteins. Uh, any chemical reaction that happens in our body, it's a catalytic reaction that is uh, facilitated by enzymes. Again, there are proteins. Even the skin that we have is uh, elastic because it has a special protein that is called collagen, right? So basically they're everywhere and as a result, if something goes wrong with proteins, probably we can get sick or even die. So that's why they're very common therapeutic targets. So we want uh, to develop drugs that do something to the proteins. Now, how proteins work, basically it's a chain of amino acids, right? So basic building blocks. And uh, when you leave this chain, uh, this long sequence uh, in some environment, under the influence of electrostatic forces, it will fold into complicated structures, like what you see here. So secondary or tertiary structures, and this is called protein folding. It was actually hypothesized by uh, Anfins and a Nobel laureate in chemistry that uh, you can predict the structure of the protein entirely from the amino acid sequence. And it's been really a hard holy grail problem of structural biology to try to do it computationally, and it was solved uh, uh, gloriously by DeepMind with the, the alpha fold. So that was really the, the kind of breakthrough moment uh, uh, that, that structural biology experienced a couple of years ago that completely newcomers came and with deep learning were able to, to, to solve their, their most important problem. And uh, nowadays AlphaFold, at least in some situations, can predict the structure proteins uh, very accurately. So it's already useful for, for, for biologists and it's, it was really a groundbreaking discovery. It is actually a geometric deep learning architecture. So without going into details, and uh, it is uh, quite complicated uh, architecture, but one of the basic building blocks, uh, the, the geometric part of AlphaFold, uh, what they call invariant point attention. So these are special type of equivariant graph neural networks. They, they uh, account also for the symmetries of the, the positions of the, of, of the nodes of the, uh, of the molecular graph. And obviously it appeared on the cover of Nature, so it was a very big, uh, big deal when, when, uh, when it was published. So when we try to design drugs, we are actually interested in the opposite, in the inverse problem, right? You can call it kind of inverse folding, which is not exactly correct, but we want to find the sequence that will fold into a certain structure. And this structure uh, will allow will uh, equip the protein with certain functions. So the good analogy is to think of a kind of a lock and the key, right? So same way as we have only one key that will fit into a lock, same way we have one molecule that will fit into some kind of structure into a hole on, on a protein surface and will bind to it and that is the kind of drug that, that we want to find, right? So something that is very specific, very unique that it will fit only into a protein and uh, into that particular protein and not any other. So this is of course wishful thinking and if you I think the, the number that I read, uh, drugs uh, interact this way or another with something like 50 different targets, just because they have these kind of side effects. So that's why drugs are not perfect and sometimes they can have uh, harmful uh, uh, impact uh, besides what they, they, they try to do. So basically, if you were to abstract out m how most of the drugs work, so you have a protein, it has a molecular surface, it has a hole in it, so some kind of pocket-like structure, and you try to fit something into this hole, right? And uh, what is shown here, so I had my favorite molecule of caffeine, right? So that's how caffeine affects your brain. 
So this is the adenosine receptor, or it's a three-dimensional structure, and that's what, what happens when the, the molecule uh, that you drink every morning uh, binds to it and uh, basically creates some chemical reaction that makes you feel in the way that you feel when you drink coffee. Now, when we design new drugs, of course, Caffeine was discovered probably by chance, so people tried it and they, they liked it, and then uh, many centuries afterwards we understood actually what it does in our brain. But uh, when we try to desi design new drugs, we often know the target, but we don't know what molecule will, uh, will bind to it, right? So we want to do some kind of virtual screening. So we want to computationally, out of all the possible small molecules that, that we can synthesize in the lab, uh, we would like to predict molecules with, uh, with good properties. And it's not only binding affinity, it's also other properties like, for example, we want, in order to deliver this drug, we want to, it to be able to, we want to be able to dissolve it in water, right? Or we want it not to be toxic, right? So what, what point is in a drug that, that will bind to, to your, your therapeutic target, but it will at the same time kill the patient, right? So there is a bunch of properties that we want to predict. Unfortunately, the search space for molecules is extremely large, something like 10 to the power of 60. So uh, it's almost as large as the number of atoms in the universe. So it's definitely impossible to, to, to explore by experimental methods. So computational techniques exist exactly for this purpose. And craft neural networks actually excel in predicting uh, certain properties of molecules. They are much faster than uh, more traditional methods like, like molecular dynamics or, or, or uh, density functional uh, theory-based methods. And there was uh, a big breakthrough a couple of years ago. A group at MIT used craft neural networks in a virtual screening pipeline, trying to find new compounds with uh, antibiotic activity against antibiotic resistant uh, organisms. And uh, as you probably know, I think every year it's estimated that about 2 million people die globally from antibiotic resistant organisms. So a, a pandemic that will be caused by a pathogen like this, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And we are running out of antibiotics, so we need something new. So we need uh, ways to discover them. So computational discovery is exactly what, uh, 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 what, what was done there. And actually they discovered that an experimental anti-diabetic drug that is called halicin has strong uh, antibiotic activity. So it can uh, kill a bacteria that, that would be resistant to, to other conventional antibiotics. So again, it's not that particular drug, but it's the pipeline and the approach, the data-driven machine learning based approach that, that uh, allows to, uh, to discover these, these new molecules. Now, uh, the picture that I showed you, maybe it's a little bit optimistic, so to assume that we have a protein with a hole in it and we can s stick some small molecule in it, some interesting targets actually do not look like this. So no holes, no pockets, it's just completely flat. And one example is what is called protein uh, the program death complex. So these are proteins that uh, exist in our immune system and they uh, basically they're expressed uh, outside uh, cells and they tell the immune system that we are healthy cells, don't touch us, right? And what happens is that uh, we have malignant cells that form uh, in our uh, body all the time. And most of these are killed by normal functioning of the immune system, but it happens that some of these cells actually express these proteins that uh, confuse the immune system and make them pass for good cells, so then they, they replicate, then the tumor grows, and then we have a problem, right? And uh, the idea of immunotherapy is to block one of these proteins. So it's a complex, it's uh, what is called PD-1, PD-L1, program death ligand and protein, the program death receptor. Uh, you create a binder, so some molecule that, that will stick to one of these proteins and it will give back, in a sense, uh, uh, control to the immune system and then it will be able to kill normally these uh, malignant cells. And actually there have been several uh, 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 protein-based drugs, what is called biological drugs or biologics that that, that have been very successful for curing certain types of cancers that maybe 10 years ago would be a certain death sentence for the patient. So nowadays that can be completely cured with, uh, in this way. So basically what we want to do here is to design a protein rather than a small molecule that will bind the target. And with my collaborators in Switzerland, in Lausanne, the, the group of uh, Bruno Correa, uh, they actually do proteins in the lab. Uh, we do the computations and the machine learning, but they actually build these molecules. So we developed a method uh, called MASSIF that um, allows to, to build new proteins from scratch, what is called de novo design, that have certain uh, uh, desired functions or certain properties. So they bind different targets. So here you can see some uh, binders that we designed for, uh, for the, this uh, oncological uh, immunotherapy protein. Here's another example. So this is uh, very well studied protein in the last years. So this is the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. As you probably know, this is what terrorizes for the past three years. 
causing the, the COVID-19 disease. So we developed a binder that will stick to the, to the spike protein and will prevent it from entering the, the host, basically our body, through what is called the ACE2 receptor. So that's probably everybody is an expert here on COVID, right, and, and, and the coronavirus. And uh, here we tested also uh, both computation and experimentally. So this is actually uh, uh, examples of um, neutralization activity of a pseudovirus. So of course, we never worked with a real virus, so it was a kind of a harmless virus that you can work with in the lab against different variants of this uh, of these coronavirus, and also compared to it to um, a cocktail of antibodies that is a clinically approved drug that that was manufactured and and commercialized by AstraZeneca. So of course, it, not the same level of inhibition, but still for something that was designed uh, computationally by machine learning methods, I think it's pretty remarkable, at least for me, a computer scientist that doesn't understand much about, about drug design. So the dream, of course, is something that uh, similar to what you have, for example, in these uh, diffusion models, right, that probably everyone has played with, like Mid Journey or DALI 2, right? So when you, you write a text prompt and you generate an image, right, like here, painting of an astronaut riding a dog on the moon, right? So this is uh, the prompt that I gave and this is what the model produced. So we want to do something like this for molecules. And of course the prompt will probably look differently. So I want to condition the diffusion model maybe on the geometric structure of the target. So we have different versions. We might have already maybe some molecular fragments, what is called pharmacophores that are docked to some parts of the, of the target. And then we want maybe to link them into a stable compound that, that then can, can be used as a drug. So we are still not there. It's probably still science fiction, but probably I think a few years away from, uh, from this kind of, uh, of dream. And of course, there are many other criteria, many other considerations that you would like to optimize for to make it a, a real drug that can be used then in the clinic. But the bottom line that it will make things much faster and much cheaper designing new drugs that may be also personalized for, every, for everybody, for every patient. So I might have a drug that works exactly against my type of cancer that is my specific, uh, uh, it takes into account my specific genetics rather than something generic. So it might be really uh, transformative in this field. So uh, another approach that, is, uh, that exists in um, developing new drugs is actually not to develop a new molecule, which uh, is expensive and can take a lot of time. And typical time scales for developing new drugs and putting it on the market is about 10 years and about uh, $2 billion, so it's extremely expensive and most of them fail at different stages of clinical trials. So instead we can take existing drugs that are already known to be safe and approved by organizations such as FDA, uh, but use them in combination with other drugs. And some of these combinations can, be, uh, can produce uh, undesirable side effects, right? And this is something that uh, often is known during clinical trials. So often you will have a leaflet with your drug, don't take it with that one, and don't, don't take it together in combination with other drugs. But some of these side effects are actually unknown and they're discovered uh, throughout the use of the patients. And some of these side effects can be very serious, right? So, and craft neural networks actually have been used by a group of Marin Kazitnik at Harvard to predict these side effects uh, uh, reliably using, uh, well, the graph that, that they used was uh, uh, drug to protein interactions. So, uh, basically modeling how the drugs uh, work uh, with the, the biochemistry of our body. But the, these side effects, uh, they can be also positive. So we can have a combination of drugs that has a nonlinear synergistic effect. And that's the kind of comb combinatorial treatments that ideally would like to find. So we had a big collaboration involving uh, Mila in Canada, the, the group of Yosha Benjo, funded by the, the Gates Foundation, where we looked for uh, combinations of, uh, of anti-cancer drugs that produce exactly this kind of nonlinear effect. And actually, we found some interesting combinations that then we found that, that uh, they were clinically tested and uh, uh, indeed the predictions uh, coincided. So uh, this actually doesn't need to be limited only to uh, synthetic compounds, to, to drugs that we uh, design in the lab. We can also apply the same ideas uh, to molecules that can occur uh, naturally. And uh, in particular, I'm talking about uh, molecules that come from the plant kingdom and uh, the, those that we eat, right? And uh, when we eat vegetables or fruits, we put into uh, our body uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of different bioactive molecules. About most of them, we have no idea what they do. Of course, they come in uh, tiny doses. And many of them actually come from the same chemical classes as some of the drugs against, for example, used against cancer, right? So uh, actually, it is in, uh, even uh, apparent in the names of the drugs that they come from, from plant kingdom. Many of them were discovered serendipitously. So 
let's say, uh, aspirin, right? So the chemical uh, name is, uh, uh, is salicylic acid, so it comes from the name of the willow tree, salice in Latin, and from ancient time it was known as a, 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 for its analgetic effect, or campocicin, so it's, uh, it's um, a chemotherapy agent uh, uh, that is used, uh, that, that uh, originates from the bark of a tree that, that grows in China. So basically a lot of stuff that, that we eat potentially has either good or bad, uh, bad effects. And uh, this is not something that is tracked by regulators. We have no idea. We don't have any information about, I don't know, flavonoids or, or uh, indoles on, on food packaging, right? As we would have for, for example, proteins and carbohydrates. So uh, we try to use uh, machine learning techniques that similar to what is used for drug repositioning and drug retargeting to try to uh, understand what kind of molecules uh, might be beneficial in food and also doing it by looking at how they bind to different proteins. So we looked at protein to protein interaction networks and how uh, drugs interact with them. And by uh, basically using as uh, our training set, as our positives, drugs that were approved by FDA as uh, uh, oncological drugs, right? So they have some anti-cancer effect. We tried to predict similar properties for molecules that uh, would be based in food. So once we have, uh, we trained some form of a graph neural network that would tell us whether a molecule is anti-cancer from the way that it interacts with uh, different proteins in our body, then we could apply it to, uh, uh, to molecules that occur in food and we'll try to understand uh, whether it might have anti-cancer effect or not. So of course, a big part of the work was actually to validate, at least uh, from the literature, whether indeed these molecules have effects like anti-proliferation or anti-angiogenesis. But long story short, we created a map of different foods that uh, based on the, on the richness and the, and the concentration of these different compounds. So don't take it uh, as a medical advice. Uh, I need to say a disclaimer, but uh, some of the foods were actually not surprising. So they were known for, for these kind of uh, healthy benefits. And of course, again, being a data-driven method, it doesn't necessarily need to be anti-cancer activity. It can be, can be other things as well. So probably the coolest part of this project was a collaboration with uh, Michelin star chef uh, Bruno Barbieri. So he's very famous in Italy. He's one of the judges of uh, MasterChef program that appears on TV. And uh, he used the, the ingredients that we discovered computationally with, uh, with these graph neural networks to uh, propose recipes. And the reason why he's, uh, you can see him in bed, it, because it was a collaboration with Vodafone Foundation who uh, made uh, available for us uh, a computational platform called Dream Lab that allows it's a kind of citizen science project that allows you to donate the idle time of your smartphone during night to do some number crunching and uh, we could use this to, to, to make these predictions. So I think I, I would like to probably end on this uh, tasty note and I uh, started with a quote uh, from Weil, so I would like to end with a quote from Elvetius, which I think uh, somehow captures the, the spirit and the idea of uh, geometric deep learning, well, this uh, a little bit arrogantly named Erlangen program for machine learning, and uh, Elvetius famously said that the knowledge of principles compensates for the lack of knowledge of facts, and indeed, don't think of deep learning as some kind of collection of tricks and hacks. Uh, it has deep mathematical foundations, deep roots in geometric concepts like symmetry, scale separation that basically form our universe. So that's how the world we live in that these are the pillars on which it is built. So I will stop here. Thank you very much.